Hello, I'm Marvin Pierce, the dog teacher. And tonight we're doing Facebook live feed and we came back to the house, the kitchen table, dining room table, and we're just gonna talk about different dogs and problems and try to answer some questions. Hopefully tonight we'll have some, answer, some questions to answer. And if we do, I've got Brett here helping me tonight. He's gonna shoot the questions to me so I can try to answer them. And we're going to talk tonight about how do dogs learn, when do they learn, why do they learn, and some of the topics are, <clears throat> for me, it's uh, what's the most effective way to teach dogs. Another one's, uh, do dogs learn better in packs or alone? When dogs get... Uh, distracted while training, what do we do to, to get them back to focus? Uh, does treat training work? I'm sure it does for some people. I've never had any luck with it, but I've never tried it enough to say why. But just for the fact that when I started training dogs, my first dog was a bird dog, and I just felt that they wouldn't work for me because I was in a spot where I thought I would have the wrong flavor of treat. Uh, I'd run out of treats, my dog wouldn't be hungry, whatever. I feel that dogs always want to be told they're good if you mean it when you say it. And if you teach your dogs when they're wrong and then when they're right, they'll try to be right more often than wrong. So let us know how we're doing out there on Facebook Live because like I said, we are back at my dining room table. I don't know how great it's going to be. Uh, Hopefully it's good. The weather's not great tonight, so <clears throat> we've got a little bit of cloud and rain. Normally when we have that, the Facebook feed don't work as well. So we need some good questions from people, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a lesson I've done recently. I, uh, I had a gentleman came in, and uh, he was, I don't know, my age or maybe a little older than me, but he had a dog that he couldn't get a recall on, and he let it out in his backyard and it jumped the fence or go under the fence. He wasn't sure how it would get out and it'd be gone, and then he couldn't catch it. And other people could catch it, but he couldn't. It'd go right up to a stranger, but it wouldn't go to him. And for me, it tells me that when he goes out in the yard to play with his dog, when he does finally catch it, he's probably aggravated his dog. He puts the leash on the dog and he puts the dog up. And he said, I was perfectly correct that's exactly what he done because sometimes it would take an hour or two and he'd be several blocks from home by the time he got his dog caught so we used e-collar with his dog and then i got three of my good dogs out uh and took them back out into our big playground to work i worked with them in my round pen then we went in a lane i have and then we went out into the field and we got his dog coming back to him. He was pretty surprised that within an hour we had his dog coming to him when he called it. But there's several key things. One of them is, is when we caught the dog, we would let it go. And then I brought out three dogs that were pretty chilled out. One of them played with him for a few minutes and then it just went over and laid around. So I feel that some of, one of the questions or one of the comments topics we're talking about tonight is how to train dogs with other dogs. I used two real low-key dogs and then I used one that had a little bit of energy. The one had a little bit of energy, it played for a few minutes, then it quit, and then it just wanted to hang out and be petted and liked and talked to also. So it really fed onto his dogs to do the same thing. And like I said, within an hour's lesson we had his dog coming to him out in the field and we got it to quit pulling on the leash so bad. And I feel that he learned how to use the e-collar. One of the big things with him and the e-collar was that he had the e-collar loose on his dog, it wouldn't work. And sometimes people think their dogs are a lot tougher than they are, and so they keep turning up the e-collar. And by the time they get it really hot, the dog moved itself so they, the prongs do touch, and so then it shocks the dog a little harder than it needs to be. And so then it hurts the guy's feelings, and he doesn't want to do that no more, and that's he ended up here. So now I feel that he's on our way to success with his dog because he wants to take his dog's dog to the beach and let it run and play and be able to take it to different places and just let it hang out because the guy's retired and he likes to hang out with his dog. So I feel he's on the way to do that. But 
for me, the key thing was was to get the dog in with some other nice dogs that would come to you to be petted and that pup was a pup year old, I think. And all it wanted was petted and loved on anyway. So I feel that that was the things that really contributed to that. Uh, we got any questions, Brett? Not yet. Really? People say that our audio sounds really good though. Oh, nice. So do we have people watching us then? Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and everybody make sure you go to our Marvin Pierce Dog Teachers YouTube videos. And check us out. Uh, we're now on TikTok, uh, Instagram. Did you load the video up of Tank catching that ball, right? Yep. Where did it go? Uh, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Cool. So it's on all three. But we got a little dog out here that was pretty honored when he got here a couple weeks ago. And he would bite you. Didn't even need a reason, actually. He'd just walk by and bite you, I guess, because he wanted to. But he's doing really good now, and we've got him playing ball and fetching and catching. And he would do it before, but he just didn't like to give the ball to you, and he's just really possessed with it. So I feel that he's made huge leaps and bounds with it all. And we started, like I said, putting some on there uh, of different dogs. And we've got videos of one dog that bit, bit me, I don't even know how many times, when the first, first lesson it came here for, and it was just for lessons. and because uh, you couldn't touch his legs and couldn't wash his eyes and all kind of stuff. It was a little poodle thing, some kind. Of, and by the time they left with it after the last lesson, you could wipe his eyes with a wet rag and you could touch all of his feet and rub him and you could brush him. You couldn't groom him either when he got here. So it really made a lot of difference with him. So we need some questions. Uh, so... So how did you start, or how did you get the dog to start dropping and leaving the ball? You know, for me, we've had a lot of dogs here that are just so possessed with a ball and a stick that people can't get it. And sometimes you get bit. I've got a big German Shepherd up here now, uh, Shadow. He don't like to give you a stick. And tonight he finally gave it to me three or four times and I quit with him. But I feel that if you train dogs like I do with the pinch collars and then you I eventually go over to the electric collar. But for me, every time I go at my dog, if I pinch them with a pinch collar a little bit, <clears throat> we use the plastic collars. That, well, actually, we've been a dealer for them forever. But if I pinch my dogs with that and at the same time, then I start leash training them with a pinch collar and an e-collar, and I growl at them and I start using electric collar a little bit, my dog starts learning that whatever he's doing when he hears that noise, it's wrong. So the majority of the time, not always, but majority of the time, when I start teaching a dog with a ball or a stick or a frisbee, I have my dog on a pinch collar and a leash, and then I will have them fairly close to me and I'll drop the ball, and if they try to get it, I'll growl at them and not allow them to do it. Then I'll pick the ball up, I'll drop it four or five times like that and not let the dog grab it. And then I'll throw them the ball and let them go retrieve it. When they get to me, I'll get a hold of the leash because I'll, normally I'll have them dragging it and I'll ask them to drop. And for me, depending on the dog and how bad they are, but normally I will touch the ball with my thumb and finger and I'll ask the dog to drop. If he doesn't drop, I just growl at him a little bit. And the majority of the time with me, they've dropped the ball or just frisbee or a stick. Uh, if I've done my homework with leash training. I think a mistake people try to do make is they try to take an object from a dog. If you teach a dog to leave the object when you drop it on the ground before you ever start, the majority of the time for me it's worked out where they'll start giving me the ball or the frisbee or the stick. So hopefully that answers your question. Carrie, you said? Yep. And if you notice, I got a new hat on tonight. We do sell the Martin Pierce Dog Teacher hats if you need any. Uh, the pinch collars, we're a dealer for Garmin, uh, new vet now, vitamins. Uh, we've got our leashes. We've got our own line of leashes coming out from uh, here. They're made in Portland. Hopefully they'll be out here this week or next week. And what else do we got going tonight? No other questions? Not yet, no. 
Dogs get distracted while training <clears throat> is one of the questions we have here, and how do you solve that? You know, sometimes when a dog gets really distracted when you're training, they're bored with it, and they're not focusing them because they're just burned out, they're bored. I feel that people try to train dogs, and one of my mottos is, is I'll teach a dog more in minutes than you can in hours. And I think it's huge for dogs to be able to be worked with for minutes instead of hours. It makes a lot of difference for their focus. And if you get a dog who really wants to learn and you bore them to death, they'll, they'll quit you. And at the same time, for me, if I'm working with a dog, I'm really teaching hard on a set, down, stay, uh, don't jump on me, whatever. If I get to a really good point in any one of those commands and teaching it, a lot of times I'll quit. And I'll put the dog up or let him go play or lay in the sun or whatever and leave him alone for a while. Now, I might get him out an hour or two later and start working on him some more and try to advance what I just taught him. Once I get that to a really good spot, then I'll try to go to something else with him. And today, Suzanne and I was talking about dog training because she had two dogs, Bodie and uh, Fenway, out. And both of them got wound up pretty tight. And she asked me what was the best way to get both those dogs listening. I feel for her, she owned Bodie, so that's the dog I would have worked on, just getting him to calm down and, and listen. And then I would have tried to work with Fenway. Because when you try to work with two dogs equally at the same time, it's, it's a pretty hard battle. But for me, she had the one good foundation dog, which was her own. And if she would have just settled that dog and then started on Fenway, she could have settled both dogs. But it's hard to train two dogs at the same time. All right, so what do we got here now? Sherry said, any tips trimming nails? Uh, and trimming nails without it becoming a wrestling match. They are, and I've got a pet bull up here right now that they can't trim his toenails. Uh, he, and he's a 95 pound pet bull or whatever, and I, I think that he would maybe try to bite somebody. And for me, and I was talking to them about, Dari and I was up here one day and we had a big pet bull come in from the coast. And I, if I'm not mistaken, the only thing they wanted to do was teach that dog to let them trim his toenails. And I couldn't touch the dog till he bite me, so he wasn't very nice to me anyway. So the lady handled it, and he didn't come to me to bite me, I just couldn't go approach him. He stayed away from me, well she kept him on a leash, but. So we taught her to teach her dog to take it and let her do it. One of the things I feel with trimming toenails on dogs is people make it a game when they start. And so then it's a game from then on. And for trimming toenails, I go back to, you've got to put the foundation on the dog. I'll go back to the pin collar. I'll go to the leash. I'll work with my dog for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if I run him on a treadmill, I might run him for a mile or so, get him wound down a little bit. I might work with him a couple more minutes, and then I'll try to pick up a foot. And if he tries to move, I'll, I know because I've already done my homework that teaching him my growl means there's going to be consequences. And I won't even go and trim a toenail. Dari and I here recently done a beagle dog that tried to eat me and her. And I was holding, she was trimming. And she only trimmed part of the toenails and we went back a few days later and trimmed the rest of them. And by the time we went back and trimmed the rest of them, the dog didn't even care. He was cool with it. But sometimes I feel that people traumatize the dog when trying to trim a toenail. <clears throat> that's why they don't like it or they just keep on and they don't win and then they quit if you don't win you, you've lost and the lost will go on to the next place just same as the winning will and for me with that dog if I got a real issue with a dog and a toenail trimming which we do right now in the, pit, in the kennels and I'm hoping we can get him get him over it but if I can trim one toenail successfully I'd probably quit and then I'd do something fun with my dog and I personally, I would probably start with a back foot because that's furthest from the mouth. And don't pull the legs out to the side where it splits the hips apart because it's uncomfortable for them and it'll really make them mad. So for me, that's where I start with. Is that someone we know? Yeah, that was also um, Carrie. 
What's that? What's that saying? You say, "Quit your dog before it quits you." In your training, is that right? Yes, I always try to quit before they quit. If you don't, you're just going backwards, you know. And and like I said, it's you know, for me, I normally I'll teach a dog more by not speaking than a person can by speaking to them because they don't understand the English to start with any language really to start with, yeah. and. People really get aggravated at a dog because they won't listen to them. It's like, how can they listen to you when they don't understand what you're saying? It's kind of like me talking to people sometimes about dog training. I will say something assuming they understand what I said and they come up with a whole different world than what I just said. So, can you imagine a dog when they don't understand us, our language to start with, but yet we want them to understand us and listen to what we say? Yeah, yeah you know what they say when you assume. <laughs> Samantha said, how do you get your dog to quit barking at everything outside? You know, we've done like three or four of those recently. For me, I go back to I, the foundation. Teach your dogs to respect you when you ask them something. Go back to the pinch collars, uh, the electric collars. A dog barks at everything outside to me. It's just a rude behavior. And I feel that a lot of times they do it because they feel they're supposed to. Uh, they sometimes they do it because they can't just sit down, flip the switch off, and relax. And any one of those things will make it happen more frequently. The louder bark sometimes, whenever you're screaming at your dog louder to quiet, they bark louder so they can bark over you. But for me, without an e collar, I would just go to the pinch collars and put a leash on them. And I'd work them in the house. And then I, instead of waiting for somebody to be outside making a, ha making a noise to happen, I would have somebody to go outside and do something or call a friend and have them come over and do something. If a dog starts barking, I'd be like, ah, quiet. But I only tell my dogs to quiet after I've told them they're good. And then I ask them to be quiet. Now, if you live in town, or even me here at my house, if my dog can hear a car going down the road out here, he don't need to bark. If they come up my driveway, he can bark, but if they're not, then he can't. So sometimes you just gotta teach your dogs they can't bark at every noise they hear. And to do that, like I said, I go with a pinch collar, and if my dog's barking, somebody's pulling up my driveway, walking up my sidewalk, or knocking on my door, I'll tell them, good boy, now quiet. If my dog's barking at squirrels that's running through the yard when they're in the house, then I'm not going to ask them to quiet. I'm going to get a hold of the collar and tweak on them a little bit and then, I no, quiet, to teach them. And I did say quiet, but it's after I give them, already I give them a warning, I've corrected them, and then I'll wait for the next one to come by and just keep doing it. But the biggest thing is for people I feel is they get really aggravated at dogs when they're trying to train on them. And the more relaxed you can get and take a deep breath, uh, the training will go so much faster and better. Good. Someone asked, how do we teach some uh, a dog to leave a said thing? So like if they're playing with something that they're not supposed to be playing with, how do I train them or teach them to leave it? For me, I always take something that, and I teach my dogs to leave everything. Uh, even the cow dogs, you know, I teach them that'll do. That means that they're done with their job. They just clocked out and it's time to move on to something else. If you want to teach your dog to leave something, for me, it depends on the dog. You don't want to get dog bit, but if my dog's just not overly aggressive with it, like I said earlier, I'll take my dog and I'll do it with a treat too. It doesn't matter to me or treat, ball, frisbee, whatever. I'll put my leash, my pinch collar on my dog, I'll work with my dog a while, I'll go to the end of the leash and I'll play with him, make him focus on me, get him concentrating. And then I'll shorten my leash up and I'll drop the ball or the frisbee or whatever it is I've got. And if my dog tries to get to it, I leave it. And I'll just walk off with my dog and I'll make him come with me and I'll go back over and I'll pick it back up again. And I'll drop, I might do it 10 or 20 times. and. Just teach my dog that he has to leave it. And then I'll play ball with him for a minute. And then I'll have him to leave it again. But I feel that if you take these dogs like that, and if you start teaching them to sit and stay while you throw the ball, you only let them get the ball when you release them. Then if you want to take it a step further, you stop them in mid-run to the ball or the frisbee and call them back. Once you get to all of these steps, it isn't so hard on them to leave things but 
for me, the leave it word means leave it, don't bother it, walk off. And I start it with a leash and a pinch collar, and I'll drop it right there in front of my feet. Okay. Um, someone else asked, Taylor asked, how do you teach, how do you teach dogs not to play so mouthy? With dogs or with a person? That's a good question. They did not clarify. So are you talking about two dogs playing or a dog with a person? For me, a dog with a person, they're not allowed to touch me with their teeth. It doesn't matter what we're doing. And then if you're talking about two dogs playing, again, for me, and we have it a lot here because the dog Fenway I was talking about earlier, and we got, I don't know, two or three dogs here that play really hard now. Or, and... If my dog has learned that whenever I go, ah, they can't do what they're doing. I'll have a dog walking forward and I growl and they'll stop and sit down or turn around and go the other way. Uh, <clears throat> I'll have a dog to start to pick up a stick and I growl and they quit. So if you do that, and I mean to me it's an awesome command to have on a dog because of the fact that if you teach a dog to be nice, for me, that means they can't bite and they can't dog fight. So if you have two dogs out playing in the field and they start getting real mouthy, for me, I'll be like, ah, be nice. And then as soon as they calm down, and they'll calm down instantly when they hear me growl, to some degree. As soon as they calm down a little bit, I'll be like, good boy, good girl. And then if I see they're still playing too rough, I'll growl them down again. And, now, and it's like going from 100 mile an hour to 80 mile an hour. And the next time I growl, they go from 80 mile an hour to 60 mile an hour. And I can tell them they're good each time. And then for me, if they don't settle down at that time, I'll make them come lay down or sit down for a while. And I don't make them lay down and sit down because they're roughhousing. I have to sit down or lay down because I want to flip that switch off. And so if you use all of this for training techniques with them, it doesn't take long to calm them down so they can't play too rough. Uh, if someone, it seems like there are a couple of viewers that have just now got here for the first time, seeing Facebook Live for the first time. So if they want training from you, how can they go about doing that? Uh, you can go to MarvinPierceDogTeacher.com. Uh, you can go to Marvin Pierce Dog Teacher Facebook. And we've got Marvin Pierce Dog Teacher YouTube channel, of course, uh, Instagram. And now we have TikTok. And we've got not a lot. What do we got? 60, 70 videos maybe on YouTube? Yeah. 60, 70 videos on YouTube now, which is a lot for me because here not long ago we had like 10. So we're stepping it up. Thanking to Brett. He does all of that stuff for us now. And I think there's a lot of videos on there that have a lot of uh, information and about different things with dogs. But... For me, it goes back to dog training. You need to have fun. I mean, if you're not having fun training your dog, then most likely you're not succeeding at a pace that you could if you figure out how to make it more fun. Uh, me, the most aggravated I get is at a dog or with a dog is when I can't figure a dog out. Uh, we got a dog here, Tank, a while back. And we should have a bunch of videos on him here for long, I think. And he came here and he was pretty honored. He'd, he'd bite somebody just because he wanted to. Uh, they couldn't hardly pat him or hug on him or nothing. And they couldn't put leashes and collars on him because he'd bite you. And the lady that owns him, she was here to swallow go with a lesson. And she was so excited because she could put a collar on him without him trying to bite her. And she sat and cheered and he sat in her lap and hung out. But I think that maybe, and I'm not sure, but I think one of their huge problems with tank was they always let him be wound tight he never had a time that like the lady she loves to sit out in the yard in her chair and read a book patio whatever it is but i don't think she ever just had tank where he could sit down there and relax with her and we were in round pen a while ago and i uh, asked her if i could take a picture of her because we were sitting in some chairs not in round pen actually in my kennels and i had her let tank jump up there with her and she started roughhousing with him, and I told her I felt that was one of his problems, and so I asked her to quit petting and loving and hugging on him and stuff and roughing him up, and 
three minutes later, he was sitting there by her in the chair with his head laying on her leg asleep, and I took a picture of it. And I think he might have still been asleep when I took the picture. But she couldn't believe he'd done that, and I think it's because she felt that he always needed to play. And the dog don't always need to play. They need to learn to flip the switch and relax. So at home in her yard, he was always had a ball in his mouth, drobbering and slobbering and foaming at the mouth and moaning and groaning and carrying on. And here I've taught him he can play with the ball when I ask him. When I don't want him to play the ball, he leaves the ball alone. So now whenever she takes him home next week or two, hopefully she can accomplish the same thing with him. So, got another one. Jennifer asked, what is the difference between a growl and saying no? For me, if I tell a dog no, it's just that he flat can't do something. I mean, and you know, I feel some people try to make their dog a robot, and some people do it. I mean, I've had dogs before that I could, and working my cow dogs, I could make them pretty much like a robot. They were push button everything I said. But at the same time, I could release them to just go be a dog. And for me, the dogs that jump on me is no. Peeing on my truck tires is no. Putting her teeth on me is no. Getting on my furniture would be no. And for me to growl at my dog, it means that they're fixing to get in trouble if they don't change their behavior. <clears throat> but I feel that a growl gives my dog a chance to think before there's actually a consequence. And so I think that's what makes uh, training huge for some dogs is because they can make a mistake and they don't get shocked or pulled or jerked. It gives them a chance to make a mistake and they get an eye and they can change their attitude. And I feel the majority of the time, if once you get to where you feel like you've succeeded with a dog, if you just, ah, they just quit what they're doing because they know they're doing something wrong. And then the majority of the time, you always want that behavior just to go away without there being a serious consequences for the behavior to start with because it wasn't like they were trying to bite you or chase a cat or whatever. We had a dog here that came in the other day and it was, it was scared. I mean, a month or so ago, whatever it was, but it was like it was scared of the world and it was a border collie, or not a border collie, but a lab. And I just felt that it shouldn't have been. When it finally left here, the people couldn't believe the difference in the dogs. And I couldn't either, because I wasn't sure if it didn't have a screw loose that couldn't be tightened. But when that dog left here, his head was in the air, it was happy to go do things, and it played with dogs, and it met me at the kennel door, it never hid in the corner. And they took the dog home and came back for a few more lessons. And they love it. They couldn't believe the difference in the dogs. But a lot of the dog training goes back to, like with them, <clears throat> their dog, before they came here, it wouldn't come in the house from the back porch, backyard, until they offered it a treat. So when they took it home from training, they didn't give it a treat and it wouldn't come in the house. So they left and went to the other room and it finally came in. So when they came back here, I told them that, for me, I would just put the e-collar on it and ask it to come in. If it didn't, I'd ah, growl at it and maybe bump the e-collar. And so they went home and tried it that night and they came back for another lesson. They said they didn't have no more issues with it. It just fixed it. So for me, they growled at the dog. They told it it was going to get in trouble and it, it got in trouble. So now they don't have to growl at the dog no more to come in the back porch. Uh, two people just asked if you could give your growl. Carrie says, can we record your growl? Because the dogs hear it and it works. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm gonna patent it. Yeah, right. And the, and the thing is, for me, I if I've got a bunch of dogs, like I've had like 22, 23 dogs on the playground out here one time by myself, and if a dog starts trouble at that time, people, my neighbors might hear my growl. It'll be rough because of the fact that it's gotta quit. I cannot have 22 dogs, and I might have German Shepherds and Rottweilers and Border Collies and Beagles and Poodles and who knows what labs out there, and I could not have them dogs get in a fight. And I broke a fight up here, I don't know, four, five, six months ago. <clears throat> I was in the round pen doing a lesson, and somebody was on the playground with a few dogs, and they got in a fight, and they hollered at me to come help them, and I ran out there. And 
they had a hold of one of the dogs by the back leg and the other dog wouldn't let go. And I was about 40 feet from him and I'm one like that. And the dog just spit that dog out of his mouth and walked off because it didn't want the consequences. So for me, the growl is that big a deal. Uh, I feel a real effective growl is that. This only you and a dog hears it. But sometimes when you're in a situation like that, those dogs had adrenaline going and they wouldn't quit. So I growled at them and they quit before I got there. As long as I don't, so long as I don't growl at my wife, I'm all right. Okay, it's uh, six thirty-two, and I think it might be effective to cut these a little bit shorter. For me too. We don't have no questions. Uh, we appreciate our training. Someone Taylor said we appreciate our training with Marvin so much. We've just, we've seen just in a few sessions such a day and night difference with our dog Ambrose. Which dog? Ambrose. Oh, cool! He was here today. Taylor, someone named Taylor? Mm -hmm. Yep, it was fun. Awesome. Uh, and for me, it is a lot of times with dogs. It's just that sometimes the people and the dog gets off on their own foot and it's hard to get back. So what we're going to do is we'll sign off then. So if anybody wants to go check us out, go to MarvinPierceDogTeacher.com, Facebook, uh, Instagram, like us and share us and all that stuff so we can spread the word out that we're trying to make a dollar. And we appreciate Y'all have a good evening.